today, and uh, we are here concerning uh, Senate Bill 46, which has to do with the uh, medical marijuana. And uh, there are questions uh, that uh, come into play about that. And, and let me just go ahead and say what I was planning to say earlier since I'm hosting this. Uh, first of all, uh, everybody says this is medical marijuana. It's not like in Colorado where they got recreational marijuana or whatever. But data showed that uh, when, Mar when uh, Colorado first introduced medical marijuana, which was the first step, that 74% of the young people, teenagers, that were uh, uh, undergoing uh, drug treatment were, uh, had gotten their first drug from someone in their family that had a medical marijuana card. 74% is where they started, was, they started with medical marijuana. And so it does have an impact, even though it may be considered uh, to be um, uh, uh, medical as opposed to regular. And then there's um, um, the, um, well, I've lost my place here. Hang on just a second. Okay. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that Christians uh, should care about this issue because it deals with the truth. I've been accused. I'm, I'm a, a Baptist preacher by, by profession. I head up the uh, Alabama Citizens Action Program now as a church-supported uh, uh, ministry, uh, ALCAP. And we, uh, I've been accused on Facebook and other social media platforms of not being Christ-like because I don't care about children. I do care about children, and that's why I'm opposed to this bill. This bill endangers the lives of students and, and young people all over this state. And I care about children, and I want them to have the best medical care, and these other medical experts are going to tell you more about that, but this is not the way to go about doing that. And so we are uh, very concerned, and, and we are trying to do what is right, and we're interested in knowing the truth. And there are a lot of people who don't seem to, to be interested in what is true. Uh, the marijuana is known as a gateway drug. Well, this legislation is gateway legislation. It's going to lead to other legislation. Eventually, it's going to be leading to uh, uh, recreational marijuana. That's been the playbook everywhere. This has been uh, passed in other states. They are constantly pushing for it. And I want to end with one story, and that is when I, I, I lobby the legislature on behalf of churches, and I, uh, in 2019, I was at a public uh, or at a, uh, a meeting of the House Health Committee here at the State House, and I was sitting next to a friend who was a lobbyist who I'd worked with on some other uh, issues, and I said, well, what brings you to the Health Committee meeting? And he said, well, I've been employed by two marijuana companies out of Florida to push marijuana in Alabama. So to tell me that this is a, uh, just some kind of uh, uprising of parents and families is not true. The marijuana industry is pushing this agenda and they are the ones that have been putting the money into getting this bill passed with the goal of passing recreational marijuana eventually. So with that said, I want to introduce to you uh, next on the uh, speaking to speak is Sharita Finch, the director of COSA. So we get your answer. Joe Godfrey with Alcap. J O E G O D F R G O D F R E Y. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sharita Finch. I'm the executive director at the Council on Substance Abuse, and we provide prevention and recovery support services. What I can tell you, I'm not a doctor, but what I can tell you is that we work with individuals particularly our adults, who come to us for services to talk about their early introduction to marijuana and how it led down a road to additional substances. What I can tell you is that we work with educators in different counties who talk about academic challenges among students who are smoking marijuana. What I can tell you is that in Alabama, last year alone, 20% more people died from overdose opioid deaths. So what does that tell you? What does that really mean? That means that people got a hand, particularly our young folks, got access to opioids and medicine cabinets. And so are we going to believe that adolescents will go into their grandmother's cabinet and say, I don't want the medical marijuana. I'm going to stick with the pills. If this law is passed and signed, is the state ready to allocate additional dollars for treatment and recovery support services and prevention services. Is the state ready to pay for that? Because that's what we'll have to deal with. Thank you.
Okay, next, Dr. Marsha Rollerson, uh, uh, medical doctor. So, Dr. Rollerson, uh, tell us who you are. And Hello, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I am Dr. Marsha Rollerson, a pediatrician in Alabama for 43 years. I'm a former president of the Medical Association of the State of Alabama. I'm a former president of the Alabama chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a former president of the Advocacy for Children program in our state. I have studied the entire 102-page law describing this medical marijuana law, its extensive, expensive, complicated plan to develop an entirely new system and bureaucracy for growing, extracting, testing, and developing dispensaries for distributing a drug that does not meet the definition of a medicine. Please look at the problems other states have had in trying to maintain safety with similar systems that we're about to try to spend a lot of money to develop. But I'm really here as a pediatrician, as a doctor for children, working with infants, children, and young adults. Please do not compromise their health and their future. The law says a 19-year-old can issue, be issued a med medical marijuana card by a licensed physician but it also says a parent or caregiver can get a card for a child of any age. Doesn't limit the age. That doctor who writes for the card, all he has to do is take a four hour online course, take an exam, and then he can treat children. He can actually practice outside his area of competence. The law lists several conditions that I have treated in children these are things I have treated over the years. In fact, three years ago, I retired as a general pediatrician and took on taking care of special needs kids. I have over 100 of those now in my practice, and I spend every day trying to give them the best care that I can. These are some of the things listed in this law that impact children. Autism spectrum disorder, depression, seizures, panic disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, and sickle cell disease, Tourette syndrome. There is now a growing body of research linking cannabis use to long-term and potentially irreversible adverse physical, neurocognitive, psychiatric, and psychosocial outcomes from children who've been introduced to marijuana for any reason. There is one drug that I use in my practice. It's called Epidiolex. It's been studied at UAB to treat two types of seizures in children, Dravet syndrome and Lennox Gestalt. I have two patients taking this drug. It has helped one of them, but not the other. But these are FDA approved drugs. As an MD pediatrician, I cannot write a prescription for marijuana. A pharmacist in our state cannot fill a prescription for marijuana because it's not a medicine, it's a weed. Did you know that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry identify ma marijuana now as a major public health concern? They oppose any further steps to legalize so-called medical marijuana. The 2020 Child Fatality Report in Texas identified marijuana as the most identified substance used by caregivers in child abuse and neglect related fatalities in that state. Marijuana, not opioids, marijuana. A lot of those deaths were children who were not being supervised because their parents were under the influence of marijuana. Marijuana used by mothers during pregnancy can impact their baby's developing brain. It has been linked to problems with memory, problem-solving skills, and behavior problems in their children. A study just published this year showed that women who use marijuana during pregnancy were 13% more likely to have a low birth weight baby. And it's alarming that that baby was 35% more likely to die before his first birthday. My husband is the medical examiner in Escambia County and he has been for 22 years. 
He has found a very strong link between positive marijuana strains and accidental overdoses, planned suicides, and death by gun violence. I support compassionate care for all of my special patients. I'm sworn to do that. It's the ethical thing to do. But the more research I read, the more I realize that if Alabama's law, law and Alabama's governor say, okay, marijuana is a medicine, what is the message that we're giving to our children? What is the message we're giving to pregnant women? The results will be dumbing down of our future and also research that they haven't agreed to. Yes, I support compassionate care for patients. I support continued research on the possible medical use of cannabis. But first, do no harm. Protect our children. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. Uh, then I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next two speakers, Dr. Michael Brown and Dr. Goodell. Goodell. Um, I hope I didn't mispronounce that. Goodell. Goodell. Okay, Dr. Goodell. Uh, both with physicians for Alabamians. So, Dr. Brown, if you'll come first, and then Dr. Goodell. So, I've come here today to speak um, as someone who's had personal experiences with marijuana in my family. Um, I also come here as a parent and as a grandparent. I come here as a physician and as a concerned physician and a concerned citizen. And one thing I just was thinking as we were all standing here, uh, and it was mentioned about the source earlier of funding coming in with lobbyists. None of us here have um, that kind of power. None of us do. We just love our families, our patients, and care for them. But we don't have that kind of power, that kind of money, that kind of influence. We're not like the Geico money man with cash just falling off of us all around here in Montgomery. But we don't have that influence. But, you know, as just common people that care for their communities, we beseech the governor and our legislators to reconsider what they're doing to us. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's been a personal experience. My son um, became introduced to marijuana, unfortunately, at an early teen. And um, he spent many years with that and then eventually progressed on to harder drugs. And, um, Last year, he eventually overdosed at age 38. And this is not an uncommon story. There's others I even to hear that I was talking with the people behind me mentioned that so many know individuals and that have experienced the same tragedy that we have in our family. And I'm involved with an organization called His Way Recovery. It's in the Huntsville, Madison County area. That's been a, a good program for drug and alcohol recovery. And our uh, director there, uh, Tom Reynolds, he's also the president of the uh, Alabama Association for Christian Recovery Ministries and represents 34 different recovery programs throughout the state, and that's 4,000 beds that are being used to try to help these people. And, and uh, just in the experience there in the past 14 years in our area, uh, of, of nearly 1,000 patients uh, having trouble with this, that. Uh, almost every one of them admit that they were introduced to their drug problem first through marijuana. Now, I know that uh, many of the legislatures say, well, this is not marijuana, but marijuana is marijuana. And the substances in it that cause the addiction are obviously present, or nobody would be interested in it. The lobbies wouldn't be interested in it. There would be no money to be made. Uh, it is marijuana, regardless of how it's administered. But as physicians, uh, as was said, you know, one of our uh, mantras has been to first do no harm. And we just ask our legislators and our government, governors to consider that as well from that standpoint, to just not to do harm. Because it does bring harm. Uh, whenever there's a law made, it's, it's a moral decision. And, and these laws, when they're passed, the citizens just naturally expect that our lawyers, our lawmakers, and our uh, government has our best interest at heart, and so if they're saying that this is now something that's legal, it's good, medicine sounds like a good thing, then it's, it will, it absolutely will increase utilization. People will try and say, well, I should try this. The government says it's safe enough to do. It's going to be offered all around. Uh, every corner you go to, there's going to be somebody to set up a shop. And so people are going to increase utilization. 
Uh, there's a number of myths that go around about marijuana, and I just want to kind of play the Mythbusters game for a minute. But one is that, first of all, that marijuana isn't harmful. But there's lots of evidence that it is. And um, as I saw in my own son, many patients, uh, problems with anxiety, depression, uh, problems with thinking, and eventually even psychosis. It's, it's very definite. And obviously, everybody does not develop these things. We're not saying that. Uh, we're not uh, saying anything that anyone else couldn't find out if you just spent the time to research it. This is very true. And so it's not a benign substance to be just handed out by people that are not pharmacists, uh, that don't understand drugs. This is not even a drug because uh, what doctor ever prescribes medications that you cannot know what the milligram or the content uh, or what's, uh, you know, what's in it? Uh, any review? Has the FDA approved it? Has it been inspected? Uh, what's the process? Uh, and others have said the myth that it's not addictive, but we know that it is. Uh, and many different levels of addiction, and different people are affected different ways, just like there are with all addictions. I mean, uh, we all know that smoking's not good for you, but my grandfather lived in uh, a ripe old age and smoked all the time. And, and, but I'm not going to recommend to my patients that they start smoking because my grandfather didn't have lung cancer or develop bronchitis. And then there's been said the myth that there's no withdrawal, but we know that's well it too. I mean, I, I can see it all the time in my son and uh, patients. It, it definitely has a withdrawal. Uh, it had, if it didn't have any effect, there wouldn't be any interest in it. So there's no quality control. The, the route of administration is questionable. Um, we have actually medications available, as was mentioned, that already that can be prescribed, that have the THC in it. Uh, and then we have these medications available for the epilepsy. So it, the, the medications are there if you really need it. But most doctors are not uh, just beating on the state house door saying, please get us medical marijuana. We need it for our patients desperately. I, I don't know physicians that are desperately worried about being able to have medical marijuana available for their patients. Most are going to be really not very pleased that they're going to be having it inundated with people wanting those cards and being able to get it. And so certainly if it's available, as mentioned, it's going to allow uh, young people to have access, as been mentioned, and then that can lead to them down the road as my son and his, and his untimely death. So we just are you know, just pleading with the governor to reconsider some pathway forward to not do this uh, to our state uh, so that we can have a state that where people can flourish rather than be harmed. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Noah Goodell. I'm a physician in Birmingham. I'm also with Physicians for Albanians. This is not your mother's marijuana. The marijuana that was around in the 70s was 2% THC, which is a psychoactive component of marijuana. Today's marijuana joints are 25% THC at a minimum. In these dispensaries, patients can buy a substance that are almost pure THC, the psychoactive component. The marijuana that is available for purchase via dispensaries has almost no CBD, which is a different substance and is the one that is potentially, again, potentially not proven to help in medical conditions. There's almost none in marijuana. Um, everywhere it has been introduced, it has increased opioid use rather than being touted to or passed the, as it was touted to decrease opioid use. It's actually increased opioid use and opioid overdoses. It is also very much a gateway drug. It is the primary drug that people start with and they move on to harder substances and more harmful substances. Um, the FDA has never approved marijuana for any medical use whatsoever. The number one reason cited for a medical marijuana card is pain. However, the International Associations to Study Pain just put out a report in which they found no benefit. Interesting. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, there is no reason whatsoever to prescribe marijuana for any medical purpose. Personally, I have seen this in a primary presentation.
presentation is cannibal cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. It is a syndrome that kills people. And you basically vomit until you can't anymore. People have actually died from this. So that when you hear, oh, marijuana has never killed anyone, between 1999 and 2006, there was almost, let's see, over a thousand deaths due to marijuana alone. I don't know if you all remember the 2012 case where someone actually gnawed off someone's face. He was taking marijuana alone. He did not pause, test positive for any other substances whatsoever. The, also, one concern for marijuana is that there are impurities. This comes from a variety of sources and we have no way to regulate or check what comes along with it. We have started seeing overdoses in which they test negative for anything that will cause the symptoms shown. However, they do test positive for marijuana. This is of concern. So those that argue that it will not medical increase medical costs are wrong. Actually, it will triple ER visits for marijuana as it has done in the states that have approved it. I can testify that there is no teaching in medical schools of marijuana. So everyone is going on what they have heard. Very few people have actually looked into this and found out what the data shows. Also a concern is that the workers in these dispensaries will have no training whatsoever. They have no medical knowledge, no certification, no way to verify the content of what they are selling or producing. They cannot be counted on to give any appropriate instructions whatsoever. So this is just one of the many dangers. I, I ask that Governor Ivey would not pass this, would veto if it comes to her desk, and would protect the Alabamians. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Reese, who uh, teaches uh, drug and alcohol abstinence programs at schools, uh, but also has a very personal experience that he wants to share. So, Mike, go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Reese. Uh, I'm a 35-year career law enforcement officer that retired and went back to work. Um, been doing a drug program in schools, trying to educate kids and, and parents. And uh, my whole career we spent talking about gateway drugs and the things that always came up was alcohol, cigarettes, and then the, the magic one that I always hated from the beginning was marijuana. And my whole career, I, it's the drug I hated the worst because even back when I was a young man and, and went to high school and a lot of people smoked marijuana, I, I had enough sense or maybe I just, I just, I was afraid. Uh, I had a brother in law enforcement. He told me what would happen to me if I used it and I believed him. We're living in a time now where kids are not afraid of anything. Um, the problems that I see with this, and, and I wanna stop and I want you to look there's not one single person here today that's getting paid to be here. People drove from all over the state because we truly care what is happening to our kids. Um, for the last year with COVID raging, we listened to the governor at her monthly meetings when she would talk about the mandates, about listen to science and, and listen to the doctors and you just heard three doctors get up in front of you and these are not paid doctors by the, by the medical marijuana people. They're not getting paid to fly in from all over the country. They're from right here in Alabama that knows Alabamians and what we are facing every day. We know what is going on and, and we're tired and we're to the point. We want people to just to listen to what we're saying, listen to the science. You hear that a lot, but, but we're not doing that when it comes to the medical marijuana issue. They're listening to what they are putting out, and, and I'm so thankful to God that we have this opportunity. Um, 
there's so many issues that we could go down and talk about how bad the bill is and what it would mean for law enforcement in the state and the thing I always try to point out is do you want your school bus drivers driving your grandkids or your kids knowing that they use marijuana in the morning or an eye doctor that operates on your eyes and he did marijuana before he got to the operating room and I, I know everybody knows the answer to that and um, I wish there was just a way that we could convey to people that they need to really take heed and they need to call the governor's office they need to let them know this is a bad bill that will affect not just your kids it'll affect your kids kids and it is time that they know the truth medical marijuana we already have it there are already you heard doctors talk about the drugs that are already out there that are fda approved there's no such thing as having marijuana from a plant that they're going to pull and a year from now they're going to try to legalize for recreational use because make no mistake about it that's the end goal here it's not medical at all it's going to be recreational and i am a firm believer when i say this the doctor that testified about his son that's a hard subject for me because my son at a young age dabbled in marijuana and then he went to alcohol and then two years ago on May the 20th, the anniversary is coming up, we found out that my son was a heroin addict. And he fought valiantly, and I am so proud of the fight that he put up. But in the end, he lost his battle a month ago. We beg people to just do the right thing. We have it in our power to listen to the professionals. But also listen to the people that are not professionals, the people that have these stories that know that your kids are worth it. We all had to fight for this. Thank you. Our last scheduled speaker is uh, Matt Clark with the Alabama Policy Institute. So Matt, come to share this. Thank you, Joe. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Clark. I'm, I'm not a physician, don't have uh, a lot of medical expertise, but I am an attorney. Um, I work for the Alabama Center for Law and Liberty. It's a new group, and it's, it's the litigation arm of the Alabama Policy Institute that's been uh, doing policy analysis for Alabama for 30 years. If you've been following the news, API has spoken out against this bill a lot, and uh, I'm here today to not only reiterate uh, some of their points, but also to bring up a legal point. So if, if you're watching and want to know where I'm going with this, I've, I've got two points to talk about today. Number one, as a legal matter, this bill is walking Alabamians into a trap where they could be incarcerated for up to 10 years. And then number two, even if this bill wasn't a marijuana bill, even if it was an aspirin bill, we would still oppose it because of other problems with the bill itself. So let, let's talk about each of those in turn. First, the legal problems. Now you heard me say a second ago that people can still go to prison for this, and you might be thinking, but you're legalizing marijuana, so how are you going to prison? Well, the answer is this. Even if Alabama legalizes dispensary marijuana like they're proposing to do here, the federal government has not. Marijuana, including marijuana for so-called medicinal purposes, is still illegal under federal law. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court has, has wrestled with the legality of that twice. In 2005, they held that the federal government does have the constitutional authority to criminalize marijuana. Right? And ironically, Justice Scalia, who has you know, been... Uh, you know, the hero of many conservatives, including myself, was a swing vote on that one. He believed, yes, the Constitution does allow uh, Congress to do that under the Commerce Clause. And then in 2001, there was a case that came up to the U.S. Supreme Court where they were trying to argue that if medicinal marijuana was legal under state law, then that should provide some kind of defense. And to nobody's surprise, really, the Supreme Court held, no, I'm sorry, it, it might be legal under state law, but we come back to what we learned in Civics 101 about the Supremacy Clause, all right? If federal law and state law conflict, federal law wins. So even if the state didn't want to prosecute people for marijuana, the feds still did, and they got to do what they wanted. So even here, if, if this bill passes, it's going to open the door for the multi-billion dollar marijuana industry to come in and set up dispensaries. And many Alabamians who 
don't know better are going to think, this is great. I, I have a legitimate business opportunity here. I, I can go into business and I'm going to be fine. Just to find later on that the DEA raids their shop and they find themselves in the U.S. Attorney's Office trying to uh, try, try to sort out a plea bargain to minimize the damage. Now, if you think this is just hypothetical and it doesn't really happen, think again. All right, take the case of Matthew Davies. He was a marijuana dispensary owner in California, and after California enacted a law that looks a lot like Alabama's, he set up shop, he was running a marijuana dispensary, just to find later on that the DEA took an interest in what he was doing. So they raided his warehouse, they found over 40 pounds of marijuana, and he got charged with 10 felonies under federal law. And these felonies, they had a mandatory minimum of 10 years in prison, all right? So it's not like the prosecutors had discretion to, to, to drop it all that much. Um, that's one of the side effects of mandatory minimum laws, and we can you know, debate that, but that, that's the reality, and that's still the reality, and it will be for Alabamians if this bill passes and is signed into law. A lot of us have probably run into. You, have you ever driven through an area where the cops don't enforce the speed limit? You know, you, you go through there, you get used to it, and what happens? People really start pushing the speed limit. And every once in a while, the cops will get out there, and, and you'd hope that when they get out there, they would pick the most egregious violations to go after. But if they really wanted to, they could get you for going one over. All right, that's exactly how it's going to work here in Alabama. If the state legalizes dispensary marijuana, our friends down the street at the U.S. Attorney's Office, who are great people, by the way, they do a good job. But just like the cop has the discretion to pull somebody over for speeding, if, even if you're just going a little over, they'll have the same discretion to go after and prosecute uh, the, both the people that run these dispensaries and the patients that are relying on that care. Except the difference is this. The penalty is not just going to be a minor speeding ticket. It's going to be you know, felony charges that can send you away to prison for years first job of the government is to protect the people. And by passing this bill, the Alabama government is not protecting the people. It is leading them into a trap where they could get hurt pretty bad. So for that reason, we want the governor to veto the bill. But then second, let's talk about policy considerations. Let's say you've heard everything today, and I agree with all my colleagues. They've provided uh, great, uh, great facts and, and great stories to tell you why this is bad for Alabama. Let's just say for some other reason you, you think dispensary marijuana is is going to be okay and you're wondering, do you have anything else? Is there any other reason why the governor should be, veto this bill? And the answer is yes, because it's structured all the wrong way. This is this is a big government and, and big marijuana bill in which the government and the people make out okay, but the people lose. Let's talk about how this is structured. If, if this gets signed into law, Marijuana is not going to be dispensed at your pharmacies, all right? They, they can't. Instead, you're going to have little dispensary shops that are set up all around the state that sell only marijuana, all right? So it's not going to go through your pharmacy. Um, speaking of pharmacies and prescriptions, though, in Alabama, we don't tax prescription drugs, and we think that's a pretty good thing because people ought to be able to get the drugs that they need. Well, in this case, the marijuana is not only going to be taxed, it's going to be taxed at twice the rate that all your other goods are here in the state. So in addition, insurance is not going to cover it. So as this bill was being debated in the House, Representative John Rogers, with whom we rarely agree, he made a point saying that this is a rich man's bill, and the folks that this is going to hurt the most is actually going to be the poor. And we actually agree with him on that point. So this is a, it is a big government bill, it is a big corporation bill that, that benefits the multi-billion dollar marijuana industry. But in addition to that, it sets up a whole new branch of the good, well not branch, pardon me, a whole new uh, commission in the government that's going to be around for a long, long time. This bill sets up the Cannabis Commission, and it, it is this commission that's going to oversee the implementation of all this in Alabama. There are two problems I especially want to draw your attention to, in addition to being another taxpayer-funded commission, okay? The first is that if the Cannabis Commission suspects you of misusing your prescription and sharing it with other people, they can come and search your house or your business without a warrant. That is explicitly in, in the bill. You know, it, it's been a bedrock principle of uh, you know, our, our country for a long time that your home is your castle, but not according to these people. And then second, there was an amendment in the House that was proposed that would uh, make the Cannabis Commission go away if the feds ever legalized marijuana. And that was defeated narrowly. So even if the feds legalize this, we're going to have another commission that's around for a long, long time. So both because of the legal and policy problems it's going to cause, 
we urge the governor to veto it, and we urge the legislature not to override that veto. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our list of speakers, but there are some up here that have not spoken. If you'd like to say something, if you've got something you want to share, we welcome you to take the opportunity to do that. Anybody? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, come ahead. My name is Laura Live Oak, and I'm here on behalf of MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. We do not need to make anything easier to get, obtain to kill our children. Drunk driving and impaired driving is 100% preventable, and if we let this pass, then it's going to be more opportunities for teenagers and young children to get a hold of it and then more opportunities for them not to only destroy their lives by the bad choices that they make, but destroy the lives of the victims' families. We need to save our children and keep them, not only the ones that's innocent that gets killed by it, but keep the ones that's getting into it out of it and teach them right from wrong. Thank you. Okay, we want to thank WSFA TV for being here. Appreciate that. And uh, Becky, thank you with Eagle, Eagle Forum, Forum for uh, uh, posting this. And so we appreciate everybody being here. Thank all of you. Thank for you.